director of the Source China Institute. Before I start with the webinar and introduce the speaker, let me remind you that this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available after the event. For this evening's webinar, I am delighted to present to you one of the world's best political scientists working on China. And he is, of course, Professor Andrew Nathan. And he is going to speak to us on the subject of Biden's China policy, old wine in new bottles, question mark. Andy is the class of 1999 professor of political science at Columbia University, where he had also served as the director of the Weatherhill East Asian Institute and as chair of the political science department. And for those of you who know Professor Nathan's work, you would know that he is not only a very distinguished academic, but also somebody who um, act on his belief in human rights. And he has served on the board of the human rights in China, or he is still a member of the board of the human rights in China. And he had previously served on the board of the National Endowment for Democracy and also for Freedom House. As a scholar, I think uh, Andrew has worked on China's politics, going all the way back to the earlier part of the 20th century to very contemporary and on China's foreign policy. He's also known for his work on political participation and political culture in Asia and the international human rights regime. He has published very widely. It will take me perhaps the full duration of this uh, webinar if I'm going to read out every single item he has published, so I will not do that. I will simply highlight that he's the author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of at least 14 books that I know of. Those that I think are particularly uh, interesting for mentioning for this evening is his book on Chinese democracy in 1985, the Tenement Papers, China's search for security, will China democratized? And most recently, his co-edited um, co book on China's influence and the center periphery tuck of war in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the Indo-Pacific. With that, let me hand over to you, Professor Nathan. Thank you, Steve, very much for that introduction. Um, well, the question mark after my title, Biden's China Policy, Old Wine and New Bottles, question mark is because the Biden policy resembles the Trump policy in certain ways. And there's a lot of uh, talk in the media and elsewhere that Biden hasn't changed the policy. But my view is that the policy is fundamentally different, and I want to explain why and then talk about what it is and what the critiques are of it and whether I think it's going to perhaps succeed and why. Uh, so that's the general outline of my talk. The, the Trump administration made a decisive change in American China policy early in its period in office when it declared the relationship to be that of what they called a strategic competition. Um, ever since Nixon, up until Obama, the United States, of course, as everybody who's listening is well aware, was pursuing an engagement policy with China with various ups and downs, such as the sanctions after the 1989 Tiananmen incident. But the, the idea of the engage, it's, it's actually debatable as to what the engagement policy really aimed at, because some people now say 
it failed because China did not become a democracy. But I, I think that the engagement policy really among the strategists who ran the policy inside the government, not the rhetoric, but the real policy, was not to democratize China, but it was to make China into a friendly country to the United States, into a so-called responsible stakeholder that would be satisfied with this, the international system in which the United States was the dominant power. And in that sense, it did fail because uh, China has uh, never really been satisfied with its uh, security position in the American dominated world. Um, Steve referred to one of the books that I co-authored called China's Search for Security. And my co-author Andrew Scobell and I argued that uh, China was uh, not a satisfied power from a security point of view. It had a lot of uh, threats that it faced, including internal threats from its own middle class that was undergoing very rapid change in ideological disorientation, and from the peripheral peoples, the, 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 pop, the Muslim populations in Xinjiang, predominantly in Xinjiang, and the Tibetans, and other minority peoples, the separation of Taiwan, um, unfriendly, almost all unfriendly or, uh, or dubious neighbors around it, uh, Japan, uh, India, Vietnam, and all the others, even Russia really in a long historical trajectory has never really been trustful of China, even though their relations today are quite close. And growing dependency upon an international economy that it didn't have secure access to because the United States and its allies controlled the sea lanes. And as China was importing more and more oil and raw materials and relying more and more on foreign markets, that was a vulnerability as well. So China was really not satisfied in every place that it looked. All of its security problems, it saw the United States as a troublemaker, as a chief threat, even in China's internal political issues, the Chinese leadership perceived the United States, I think excessively so, but perceived the United States as meddling, trying to destabilize, trying to uh, uh, change the minds of the Chinese people so that they wouldn't be loyal to the, to the regime. And, and, and American politicians and, and NGOs and universities, one could say, really did try to do that, but I don't think they're impact perhaps was as much of an existential threat to the CCP as the leadership believed. And they saw the United States alliance system surrounding China and they saw the United States Navy dominating um, the seas and they saw the US uh, economic preferences dominating the global economy in terms of the rules of the economy and the United States and its allies having a lock on um, you know, existing oil supplies and so forth. So the Chinese government was ne never terribly satisfied with that situation. But as you all know, under Deng Xiaoping and his two successors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, the Chinese strategy was to, uh, you know, to take it easy to hide, hide one's light and bide one's time to, to, to appear cooperative and to be cooperative in order to build up Chinese power. And that that changed, it changed as the Chinese economy grew very fast in the 1990s and the beginning of this century. And as China invested more in its military power and in its foreign economic relations, and it, it made a decisive change with Xi Jinping, who um, I think inherited the, the leadership of China at a time when, um, China had the resources to, to sort of uh, take a bolder stance. Um, I think a lot of foreign policy analysts believe that China's more assertive behavior under Xi Jinping is something about Xi Jinping's personality or his ideology. But I, and I think Xi Jinping is a tough guy, but I think that what really happened was that the time was ripe. The time was perceived by the Chinese leadership to be right for China to begin to rectify its strategic vulnerabilities. 
partly because China had become wealthy enough to do so and its military had become high tech enough to do so. And partly because the Chinese perceived the United States entering a period of weakness, perhaps surprisingly early. So, and, and I think that was a correct, actually a correct um, assessment by Chinese strategists. Um, the United States uh, already under Obama uh, confronted a you know, financial crisis, which meant a great deal to the Chinese leaders. They, they really uh, changed their minds about the United States. Um, Obama displayed a, a lack of interest in international uh, wars. He didn't follow up on his red line with Syria. And I was an Obama supporter. I understand why he did that. But I think from Beijing's point of view, it just showed that the United States doesn't have the guts to fight. And, um, and they assessed Obama himself as a, a weak leader, which is not, not my view. But I think that China assessed it in that way. And the United States under Obama became very polarized. And racism has a lot to do with that. But so does the impact of globalization on the United States. So all in all, I think Xi Jinping and his colleagues felt that the power balance had shifted even earlier than Chinese strategists intended and the time was ripe for China to behave in, behave in a more assertive manner in the South China Sea with respect to um, pressure on Taiwan, to, to launch the Belt and Road Initiative, to so-called tell China's story well, to fight back against critics of China by you know, denouncing them very directly and so forth. So China changed its um, you know, image, its foreign policy profile in a rather dramatic way under Xi. And the Americans noticed this even bef actually even before Xi Jinping came to office, the Americans were beginning to notice you know, what we called the rise of China. So even under Obama, you had the so-called pivot to Asia, which didn't amount to much and the Chinese assessed it and saw that it didn't amount to much. And so I think that was another element that fed into Xi Jinping's more assertive policy. So against that background, it was really the Trump administration that sort of really drew, drew the line between the two eras. You know, nothing in history sort of, well, at least rarely changes overnight, right? There's always some background to it. And I've described the background, but it was during the Trump administration that we really shifted um, to a policy of, of, well, what we call strategic competition, which I think is a very accurate word for it, but which has a lot of overtones of, of real hostility to China. <clears throat> and Trump then, you know, took a number of measures. Besides this designation of China as a strategic competitor, the most uh, sort of marked thing that Trump did was the tariffs on China, the trade war, which Trump said is a good thing and easy to win. But also, um, Pompeo, the Secretary of State, um, uh, originated this thing called the Quad, a, a cooperative endeavor between the United States, India, Japan, and Australia, which is not an alliance and its military implications were not clear at the beginning, but it was a symbolic, at least, kind of form of cooperation saying that these are four countries that are uneasy with Chinese behavior. The Trump administration stepped up its naval patrols in the South China Sea to enforce what the United States calls freedom of navigation. And in Gay played around, I should put it with probably upgrades in the protocol status of Taiwan, again, to send a signal uh, to Beijing. And Biden has, in fact, continued all of those uh, things, including, you know, um, not not changing, not dropping the tariffs, even though they are paid by the American consumer and are damaging to the American economy, and actually building up the efforts of the Quad, making it more uh, manifestly 
military. It's still not an alliance, of course, but there's military exercises in this famous uh, AUKUS agreement of uh, selling a US slash UK built nuclear powered ser series of submarines to Australia, ha having Australia uh, actually manufacture it in some way. It's not clear how with, with US and UK technology. So, and, 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 and even enhancing the protocol status of Taiwan. And you all know that Biden recently on a TV show asserted that the United States would defend Taiwan, although the White House then walked it back and said there wasn't any change in American Taiwan strategy. But it is, Biden was correct to say that although the US has no military alliance with Taiwan, it has a political commitment that has come to be understood as a commitment to defend Taiwan in case of an unprovoked attack. So I think that's probably what he meant when he gave a sort of, you know, four word answer, four or five word answer saying, yes, we have that commitment. So it looks like Biden has just gone along with Trump's policy. Uh, but I want to explore the differences with Biden. And there, there's really one key difference, which is that while Trump's policy was called strategic competition, it actually was not strategic competition because it was neither competition nor strategic. So I'm going to have a little uh, uh, part of part, a few minutes here where I'm going to analyze what really went on in the Trump China policy and why I think it, 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 it wasn't strategic competition. So first of all, Trump himself was only concerned with the trade deficit. We all know that Trump is not a strategic thinker. He doesn't think synthetically or long term. He's uh, uh, and he is not really interested in foreign policy, except insofar as it affects his reputation in the domestic political arena so that he can you know be popular and win re-election so pump trump felt that the uh, trade deficit was the main thing that interested him and that interested his electoral base and in terms of other issues that of which there are many in the u.s china relationship taiwan and human rights and uh, the, the so-called level playing field of trade and, you know, all the complexities of that and tech competition and climate change and so forth. Trump had no patience for any of those issues. So there was no strategy with Trump. And there was also no discipline in his administration because he wasn't in charge of China policy in the sense that I'm just describing it now that he didn't have a strategy. And because he wasn't in charge, nobody else was in charge, but he didn't uh, have the discipline to keep a close eye on all of the other people in his administration who were involved in one way or another with China. So different people went off in different directions. So, for example, his trade advisor, Peter Navarro, had articulated very clearly before he came into the administration that he thought the United States should have zero trade, zero investment, zero um, economic, zero tech relationship with China, complete decoupling of the two economies. And he pursued that in the administration, did his best to encourage measures that would move in that direction, while the US trade representative, Robert Lighthizer, a professional trade attorney, much more realistic, I would say, from my point of view, was pursuing actually changes in the China market that would open it up to, to various kinds of uh, Chinese uh, trade manufacturing and service industries, so which would be not decoupling, but if it were successful, it would be the opposite. Secretary of State uh, Pompeo and Vice President Pence are two politicians with important bases in the evangelical Christian community in the United States. And uh, both of them with a strong interest in running for future office. So they seized upon the China threat in a, in, in a 
in a way that made sense to that audience and classified China as a threat, an existential threat to Western civilization understood as Christian values, Christian Western values, and rode very heavily on the issue of religious freedom, among other things. Pence gave a speech at the Hudson Institute, which is a, a conservative think tank in Washington, where he uh, hammered very heavily on China's um, a violation of religious freedom. The, the evangelical Christian community in the United States is concerned, number one, about the freedom of Christians around the world, but that extends to, to religious freedom as a principle. And so China obviously is a pretty good target on that, on that issue uh, because they do violate religious freedom, especially of Muslims and their system of religion, which allows five state dominated religions, but bans the so-called house churches is not consistent with the American, and I would say even with the international human rights understanding of what religious freedom is. Our FBI director, Christopher Wray, was concerned about Chinese espionage, especially intellectual property rights, which is an issue for sure. And there was also in the White House something that people called the Wall Street faction, people like Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin, uh, Trump's son-in-law Kushner, uh, the one-time economic advisor who served only for a year and plus, Gary Cohn, who came from Wall Street and, and felt that China was a great place for, Wall Street, for the finance industry to make money. So they wanted to move in that direction. So the Trump administration was all over the map, not strategic. And, and the, the things that Trump did to damage the American economy and the American political system and America's relationship with its allies and so forth, all those things were the opposite of competitive. So there was neither strategy nor competition. The Biden administration's China policy, whether it succeeds or fails, is at least consistent with the concept of strategic competition. First of all, because it is it seeks to be competitive. Now, this is not an easy thing for the United States, but Biden understands and has articulated very clearly that if we're going to uh, continue to have American success in the world, and not be dominated by China, whatever that means. And that's a, a, a big ambiguity. Because uh, you know, I don't think we're going to uh, seriously li live in a world where China controls the whole world. But, but there is a competition about who's going to have more power and more privilege and whose uh, tech will, will dominate and whose currency will dominate and whose military will dominate and whose sense of the so-called rule-based international order will be the most influential. So Biden has articulated that if the United States is going to preserve its role as the biggest of the great powers in the world, it has to do better at home. It's kind of like how the United States responded when the Soviet Union back in the day launched the Sputnik uh, Earth satellite. And that was what we called then the Sputnik moment. And it led uh, President Kennedy to sort of, you know, enter the space race and sort of energized American competitiveness. And Biden has said that if uh, something to the effect that if if China's not going to eat our lunch, you know, we have to, as he says, build back better. So he's using China, first of all, kind of opportunistically to sell his plans, which, as you all know, have not yet passed the U.S. Congress. This is part of the problem with America competing is that we have this political system that's very divided and, and even intentionally uh, ties itself up in knots by having two houses of Congress and the Electoral College and the separation of powers and the federal system and so on. So the U.S. is a very difficult system to mobilize, but Biden is trying to do so and he's presenting it as competition. And I think that's uh, not just rhetoric. So it is rhetoric, and I hope 
that it succeeds in, in creating some consensus among the American political class and, and voters for the United States to get its act together, but it's more than rhetoric. It really is a strategy and it's a, a reasonable strategy, I think. The key uh, competition area, I think, in this whole competition, and it's a, an all system competition uh, of, of, of infrastructure, of uh, you know, educational system of innovation and so forth. But I think of all of these domains that are incredibly important, the most important one in the long run for uh, which country will dominate the to use the slogan, dominate the 21st century, would be the high tech area, where the United States for quite a long time has really dominated in innovation. Innovation now in the area of computer chips, 5G network equipment, and whatever will come after that, artificial intelligence, biotech, nanotech, new energy tech, new vehicles, and so forth, all of that stuff is so important and Biden is trying to put money into this, which means a little bit that the United States is moving further in a direction in which it's been moving for a long time of somewhat more of a government managed economy, a industrial policy type of economy. We, the United States says, oh no, we're a free market. The government doesn't pick winners and losers, but China and before that, Japan, South Korea, and others have been very successful in picking winners and losers. And in this 21st century economic competition, the, the United States, I think, is being kind of forced to move to some extent in that direction, not 100%, but Biden wants to invest in some of these areas and, and also more generally in science and technology and higher education. The second thing that Biden is doing that Trump uh, didn't do, or that Trump did the opposite of, is to try to work with allies and partners. So as you all know, Trump offended our NATO partners, offended the EU, offended uh, Japan, although uh, Abe was you know, very flexible and tried to nonetheless maintain a good relationship with Trump. Um, and Biden understands that our allies are a tremendous asset in the competition with China, which of course has no allies except North Korea, and it has one very important strategic partner, which is Russia. But the United States has a widespread alliance system with I think around 60 formal allies and um, quite a few really important partners like uh, India, Vietnam. Um, and however, uh, and, 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 um, and the, the value of the allies is that to the extent that they can be brought to cooperate, um, they send a signal to China uh, that, that makes it harder for China to cooperate with that vast range of countries to a certain extent and should incentive, I'm not talking about a sort of world war, which I don't think is gonna happen where all of the 60 allies join in with the American military to attack or to defend against China. But I'm saying that China will find uh, the big actors in the international system insisting on certain common principles. Uh, so for example, China's behavior in the South China Sea will meet with more or less disapproval or resistance. Uh, so the UK and France, for example, have deployed some ships in the South China Sea to show their, um, show their uh, you know, support for the US principle of freedom of navigation operations. However, working with allies is no easy thing. And so I think some people criticize the Biden administration saying you, you're not doing a good job of it. And the big example of that is the recent um, you know, mess up with France over the AUKUS deal where Biden had to go and apologize to Macron. I think it was the day before yesterday and say we didn't handle that very well. The thing about alliances is 
that even close allies never have identical interests. You think about the United States alliance with Japan, which is a very close one. But when it comes to, say, the defense of Taiwan, Japan is closer to China, has much more exposure and vulnerability to China militarily and also even economically, as well as having a completely different way of presenting itself in its foreign policy because of its World War II record. Japan is inherently very cautious about how it positions itself as an international actor. So it's not easy. It's never been easy for the United States and Japan to agree on what Japan would do. The Japan doesn't want to do as much as the United States would like it to do in case of a Taiwan scenario. And this has been an issue of negotiation for 30 or 40 years. And, uh, and Japan keeps moving a little bit closer to the, what the US would like. Uh, the, another very, very close ally of the United States, of course, is the United Kingdom. And uh, um, there was quite a gap between the US and British position on China under um, during the golden era under your previous prime minister's name. I'm just blocking, but you know the name, you know, where, where Britain was totally uh, emphasizing the commercial relationship. Now under Boris Johnson, uh, Britain has shifted a lot and has banned Huawei 5G equipment and um, uh, uh, pr prior to Johnson put a stop to the Chinese project of the uh, nuclear power station and has sent, I think one ship, maybe I'm undercounting the number to the South China Sea, but the UK has no defense commitment to Taiwan at all, understandably, and um, has long uh, not messed into that issue because of its interests in Hong Kong. Uh, and of course the Hong Kong events in Hong Kong have helped to pivot the UK to a much closer position to that of the United States with respect to China. So my point is, if you go down the list of allies, whether it's the other NATO allies, Germany is another very important example. It has no military posture in Asia. It, it, it places great emphasis on its trade and manufacturing and tech relationships with China. Um, if you go down the list, the allies, it's not easy to work with allies. They are going to never, I think, which is always a strong word to use in these contexts, because never say never. But I think it's probably safe to say that the allies will never just hop to and join onto American policy 100%. There's always a negotiation and a compromise and the relationship, the cooperation is part way. It's even more so with the Southeast Asian partners of the United States, allies and partners like the Philippines as a treaty ally, but under Duterte has not wanted to be very close to the United States. Vietnam has to really balance. Most of the ASEAN powers want to balance. India never wants to be uh, uh, to sacrifice its so-called strategic autonomy. So the ally, the, the ally portfolio, you know, is extraordinarily valuable, but it is no easy thing. The third feature of the Biden administration's China policy that's very, very different from the Trump policy is to greatly enhance the human rights element of that policy. In the case of the Trump administration, the, some members of his administration, Pompeo and Pence emphasized, as I said before, religious freedom, but there was no consistent or across the board uh, emphasis on human rights in general. Trump even uh, at one point spoke in, in, in favor of Xi Jinping's policy in Xinjiang. And um, other than you know, using human rights to sort of bash or demonize, I would say, China, the, administ the Trump administration, as far as I know, really ignored it. Uh, the, the range of human rights issues that are there in China and pulled out of the UN Human Rights Council where the, a lot of important work 
uh, on the international human rights um, you know, regime is um, carried out. Um, why the Biden administration has emphasized human rights, I think we have to give credit, first of all, simply to their conviction that human rights is an important value that they as individuals share and that they believe the United States needs to stand for. And, and perhaps they also think of human rights as part of the long-term strategy for making the world a better place to live in, which is what the human rights regime was from its initiation in 1945 with the United Nations was an, a vision of a sort of a better, more peaceful world. I think they share that view that these are important norms, even though, uh, and I'll has, hasten to add, because I'm sure many of you are thinking this, even though the United States itself has frequently violated these norms and has this notorious double standard about human rights. But I think the people in the Biden administration feel that it is, and most Democrat administrations have felt this way too, that this is something they believe in. But secondly, it's also very useful for explaining China policy to the American people, a series of presidents have found it useful. You know, in the United States, there's always this strain of isolationism that why are we even bothering? You know, China is very far away, Asia is far away, and, um, you know, it's all too expensive and uh, troublesome. But I think if one explains to, to the American people that, um, that there are severe human rights issues happening in a certain place. It's, it's one of the ways, it's not a magic uh, bullet or whatever you call it, you know, panacea for, for getting public support for foreign policy, but it is an important theme in American domestic discourse about foreign policy. Third, it's something that most of our allies really agree with us on. Uh, you know, Germany, to take an example that I mentioned before, under Merkel, at least, has really, uh, her, she's, she's often pursued a quiet, so-called quiet, you know, human rights policy, but she got, for example, got Liu Xiaobo's widow, Liu Xia, out of China by working patiently and insistently with the Chinese government. I mean, I think that the Germans, and because of their history, as well as their positioning in the world, um, they this is a thing they share. And that's true, I think, with, of course, with Britain, with France, with Italy, with the other NATO allies, with EU countries, with the EU itself, which has an explicit formal foreign human rights plank in its foreign policy and in its China policy, Japan. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a support structure for our alliances. And it is also a weak point in Chinese, the Chinese effort to gain influence in the world, not in every country. There are a lot of countries that don't, uh, where public opinion or elite opinion doesn't care that much about Chinese human rights behavior. But I think that, you know, you've seen the polling from the Pew polls and other polls that Chinese uh, image popularity has been declining in the world. And this is one of the reasons that there are other reasons too: wolf warrior diplomacy and, um, you know, kerfluffles over the Belt and Road investments and failure to make, you know, good on investment promises in the port of Piraeus and things like that have an effect. But I think the human rights image is one of them. A fourth element of the Biden-China policy, which uh, is um, different, is related, somewhat related to the Trump policy, but different is what I'll call partial decoupling. So the Biden administration does not seek uh, a black, uh, black and white or you know, a complete ban on trade and investment with China. I think it understands or takes the view, and I agree with this view, that the trade and investment with China is too vast and valuable to both sides, but here speaking of American interests, uh, um, to be inter interrupted unless, uh, uh, unless there's some kind of disaster and it would ex exact a huge cost if that relationship were to be fundamentally interrupted. 
But decoupling is necessary in certain areas to a partial degree. So the most important one, which I've mentioned already, is the high tech of the 21st century, where we have to compete and protect our advantage by being tougher about um, leakage of high tech information. And of course, the two countries are engaged in a very serious you know, espionage competition about which I don't have any concrete information, but we know that's going on. And so things like 5G, which create vulnerability for espionage, that, that has to be decoupled. And um, areas where somebody's going to win and make a huge amount of money and somebody's going to come in second, like clean energy, is an area where we really can't share uh, with uh, China uh, in the tech. And, and there are also these strategic supply chains, some of which are quite simple, pharma, uh, you know, PPE and so forth, where we need self-sufficiency from, from China. So there's going to be a, par I predict, and I think their policy is for a partial decoupling, but not to fundamentally interrupt their relationship. The final area of the Biden policy that's different from Trump is to try very, very hard to find certain key areas of cooperation with China. And one of them is climate change. And you've seen John Kerry, the president's, uh, whatever it's called, special ambassador for climate issues, meeting a number of times with relevant Chinese officials to seek cooperation. And the other, and I think, my, my own view on that is relatively optimistic in the sense that even if China doesn't want to sign some cooperation agreement on the dotted line, if we do what we need to do, and that's, as again, you know, up in the air still with the uh, Congress not yet decided on these two bills, but if the United States does what it needs to do, China will probably do what it needs to do as fast as it possibly can. You know, this is, it, it is working very hard on that, but it's not easy for a, an economy like China to be quickly, quickly turned around on a dime. The other important one is global public health, and that's proving to be extraordinarily difficult to find cooperation with, but the Biden administration wants to, and wants to cooperate as well with other areas where this is possible, including North Korea, Iran, um, it, the Biden administration would be willing to cooperate with China's Belt and Road Initiative and global infrastructure construction if the two sides can find a basis to be cooperative about it. Fisheries management, ocean pollution, things like that. So Trump did nothing. None of Trump's, um, nobody in Trump's administration did anything on that line. And the Biden administration wants to and is working particularly on the climate issue. The most difficult area in the relationship, I think, is this one that has always been the most difficult area in the relationship, which is Taiwan. And people are worried, and there's a big debate in the United States, as, as you know, about whether Xi Jinping is getting ready to attack Taiwan within the next, as the saying is, the next six years. That was what the outgoing commander of the US Indo-Pacific Command predicted in congressional testimony a couple months ago. Um, people wonder sometimes why the two countries can't just settle. I mean, you know, kind of tolerate each other on the Taiwan issue. Why, why must the United States mess in this issue when the United States is 10,000 miles away and so forth? And the answer to that is sort of historical that the United States has found itself, and I, of course, I won't go through the whole history, but finds itself with a very heavy political commitment to what we call the peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue, which really means the um, separation of Taiwan from mainland Chinese control for a law, you know, for as for, into the indefinite future, not a declaration of independence, but a frustration of the Chinese 
goal to get control over Taiwan. The United States is politically committed to that so heavily that if it, if it uh, abandoned that commitment, I believe that our whole alliance system would just fall apart. You know, no, none of our allies completely, no ally completely trusts any other ally ever in history. But particularly American allies in Asia have um, always had a lot of doubts. But uh, so far they have, say Japan has continued to commit itself to the American alliance. But if the United States walked away from Taiwan, either before a war broke out or during a war, I think the Japanese would really have to rethink, rethink and South Korea would rethink and Australia would rethink and Japan and South Korea would probably go nuclear and the NATO allies would take another look. So the United States, and, and uh, that I'm just mentioning the most sort of geostrategic reason for the United States commitment to Taiwan, but there's also an important economic relationship, Taiwan's production of high-end computer chips and the fact that it's a flourishing democracy is also very important. And in the case of China, it's, it's, it's unsustainable from a security position to have this independent island 90 or nautical miles off of its coast that is you know, beholden to China's main ally, a main uh, threat, the United States. And China needs to control Taiwan for that strategic reason, as well as for its own ideological, nationalistic, historical, and so forth reasons. And from a legal point of view, China has a very robust claim to Taiwan. Nobody says Taiwan is anything other than part of China. Even Taiwan doesn't say that. So I see this as a, as a kind of unresolvable issue that's going to go on and on and on and on for a long time. I don't see how we get to an end to it in any, I mean, I don't see the way out. So I don't know when something may happen. Um, uh, this leads to a debate about whether the United States should declare once and for all that it will defend Taiwan, the so-called end of strategic ambiguity. But in my, but but the Biden administration doesn't want to do that, even though Biden made this sort of careless statement on television. That's not what he meant. It doesn't want to do that because. Talk is cheap, and we, what the United States really needs to do is to have a credible deter, military deterrent to China, as while at the same time reassuring China that it is not that the U.S. is not maneuvering to make the situation worse, i.e., to have Taiwan declare independence. Okay, I'm coming to the end of my remarks, um, but. Uh, Will the Biden strategy work? I am optimistic. Of course, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm distressed by the, the gridlock in Congress, which could really make trouble for the Biden strategy. But uh, if that gets resolved, I'm optimistic. Critics on the right, such as Pompeo and Pence and others, believe that the United States needs to really, really pitch itself hard against China and Pence has, Pompeo rather, called for the America, the, sorry, the Chinese people to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. The right wing in the American politics thinks we have to sort of crush China. That's crazy talk. That can, it's not feasible to do so. Critics on the left say, we should you know, accept China's legitimate security interests in Asia. We should stop constraining them. We should reach some kind of a condominium, a G2. We should back off. Maybe we should abandon Taiwan so the Chinese won't be so you know, all, you know, angry at us and so forth. I think that won't work. And I've already explained, I think, my reasons for that. And it's just not international policy. You know, you, ne you never settle an issue by backing off. That just makes the other side push harder. I am hopeful that we won't have a third world war between China and the United States or, and that the two sides can continue to compete. There's no way out of that, but can continue to have a very intense competition, which is you know tough. I'm not minimizing it, but without um, a global 
crisis or the end of Western civilization or the end of Chinese civilization for a number of reasons. First of all, China doesn't actually is not has not launched an ideological. This is a very debatable point, but I'll put my position on the table. China doesn't have an ambition to spread Xi Jinping thought for the new on socialism for the new era or whatever their ideology is to the rest of the world, unlike the Soviet Union. They don't have an ideological program for the whole rest of the world. They just want the world to respect China and stop dissing China. Secondly, they're not trying to overthrow the so-called, you know, the liberal international order. They want more influence in it. They want to change the emphases, reduce the the, the human rights part of it, keep the human rights part, but reduce the, the sharpness of its edge against China and its friendly countries, have more voice in the trade rules and so on. But they, they actually like the sort of UN-based system, which is based on the principle of sovereignty. And in a way, they're quite conservative. So they're not a revolutionary power in that sense, nor do I see them as an expansionist power in the sense that they do have some territorial disputes with India, with Vietnam and other South China Sea countries and a claim to Taiwan. But those are old claims with historical roots. I'm not saying who's right and who's wrong, but they have you know a, a case for them, but they're not then saying, now we're gonna go after once we eat that up, we're going to invade Vietnam, invade the Soviet Far East, invade North Korea. That, Of course, that would be crazy for them to try to do that. So I don't see them as expansionists the way that, say, Hitler was. Um, and so, uh, and the, the final reason why I'm optimistic actually is a word of praise, if you will, for Xi Jinping and my last point in this talk, because I know I'm out of time which is to say that Xi Jinping is smart. You, he, he is not the kind of a person to uh, launch a crazy war. Or, uh, you know, he has made mistakes, I think. I think wolf warrior diplomacy is a mistake. I think the Belt and Road Initiative has proven much more difficult to um, sort of make a success, financial or strategic success than, than uh, perhaps than the Chinese hoped. But you look at Xi Jinping's behavior in the South China Sea, for example, where he um, found the moment and he built, he, he pacified Obama saying, we're not gonna militarize these islands. And he only built up islands that China already possessed. He didn't attack anybody else's islands. He didn't give any country a causes belli for what he did, and he moved uh, the so-called salami slicing tactics that Stalin made famous. Xi Jinping has practiced sort of moving out um, decisively and effectively, but without giving, you know, but in a way that didn't uh, encounter effective opposition. I think that's quite characteristic of his style. Same thing with the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a big challenge. Um, to the United States and to the sort of, um, in, you know, old European powers of their uh, uh, influence in South America and Africa and the Middle East and so forth and in East and Central Europe. It's a challenge, but it's not the kind of challenge that can create a crisis. So I think as long as uh, somebody, Xi Jinping or somebody like him is, is managing Chinese foreign policy, it's, they're not you know, crazy people. And if the United States can itself elect people who are not crazy people, which of course is a big gamble, um, then I'm hopeful that leaders on both sides can manage the strategic competition in a way that won't be fatal to all of us. And with that, I conclude and I look forward to discussion and comments, corrections. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, Professor Nathan, for this to the force of a presentation. I am not going to say too much about uh, how wonderful it is. I will um, start off with a question. But before I do that, um, let me remind everyone that if you, if you would like to raise a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A box.
When you do so, it would be very helpful to me if you could say who you are with information to identify yourself. But if you would like to stay anonymous, just say so in your question and I will respect that and will not read out your ident identification. It will simply be helpful for me in picking questions to put to the speaker. The question I want to put to you, Andrew, is the point you made about the engagement with allies that the Biden administration has done, which I agree with you. They, it, he, the administration is doing which the Trump administration was not doing. But in terms of the effectiveness of it, this is where I wanted to uh, discuss with you. Is it the American approach that is being effective? Has America been able to persuade its European allies and others to uh, work with Biden, or are they turning away from China because of the effectiveness of China's wolf warrior diplomacy? And one would perhaps go even as far as to say that if China did not have, does not have a foreign ministry in the last two years, China will have more friends in the world and it would have been much more difficult for Americans to get uh, various countries, including established democracies, to turn against China in the way that we have seen with your Pew Center uh, survey data. What's your response to that? Yeah. Yes, I agree that uh, a lot of the um, changed, like, for example, with the UK and everybody on this call knows more than I do about the UK, so please, you know, correct me on this. I think that uh, Chinese behavior had a lot to do with it. Um, I know that the, that the Trump administration lobbied the UK very hard not to use Huawei 5G, and I'm not sure what exactly caused the change in UK policy in that respect. I think it was, I'm guessing, it was actually uh, sharing of intelligence information that persuaded UK um, officials that the Huawei really was a big risk for espionage, um, but I don't know. But um, but with the um, but the behavior of the Chinese ambassador in London, I know, has been very offensive uh, to. Um, to the UK public and to the government. So I agree with you that, that the, these behaviors by the uh, wolf warriors have really helped, helped the Biden administration. And if one then tries to look at the other side and say, how effective has the Biden administration been with the allies? Um, I, I can only off the top of my head point to two examples of successes so far. One is the AUKUS deal. And the other one was the statement, the joint statement with Japan in which the word Taiwan appeared for the first time. Um, but other examples, if they exist, that is to say specifically vis-a-vis -vis China, let's say if I think about US-German relations around the China issue, I cannot report any uh, payoff right now. Well, the EU's, uh, failure to ratify the um, investment agreement could be another one, but that's really, uh, I think, more attributable to Chinese behavior, as you pointed out, to their sanctioning of a number of EU individuals and institutions rather than to work by the United States. So yeah, these two things come together. It's hard to say which per has a greater percentage of impact on shifts in, in European policy. You're on mute. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. The first question I would like to put to you comes from uh, Jim Harkness. I'll read that out. It's a bit long. Hmm. You have made a convincing case that in some areas, the Biden administration is acting more strateg strategically while continuing Trump's policies. But in at least two areas, the Department of Justice China Initiative and sanctions on imports. Biden is maintaining Trump's policies 
that I would submit are actively harmful to the United States economy, our values, and the bilateral relationship. Do you have a view on why this is? And do you see any prospect for the situation changing? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, on the tariffs, I think the problem is that the Biden administration doesn't believe in these tariffs, doesn't believe that they're useful as a tool against China, doesn't believe that they're doing anything good for the American economy. But in the current political environment, if they were to, well, for, even as a negotiating tactic, you don't give something up for nothing. I mean, even though they inherited these tariffs, um, they, they need, some China to do something, including presumably to make good on China's commitment, you know, under the so-called, what was it called, uh, you know, interim trade agreement, I forget the name of it, that the Trump administration reached with China for China to purchase. The first phase agreement. Yeah, what was it called? The first phase agreement. First phase agreement. You know, China hasn't made good on that agreement. So just you know, you inherit a, a bargaining position and you don't just give it up for nothing. But I think even more importantly is that the political consequences in the United States of abandoning the tariffs for nothing would be devastating in an environment where, um, you know, the, pub the public is so divided and the Trump faction is so vociferous and, the, you know, it would just create a, firestorm of criticism of Biden is surrendering and all. So politically, it's, it would be dangerous to give it up without an excuse, as it were, for doing so. The, the DOJ China initiative, I don't know how it has, whether and then if so, how it's been changed in its application under the Biden administration. So, I think that the Chinese um, theft of crucial intellectual property is a, a real thing. Um, the, and, and that the United States has to protect itself from it. Some of this Chinese uh, acquisition of American intellectual property and European intellectual property is legal. They read journals, they, they, uh, uh, they invest in companies. Um, they invite, they hire people. They hire people who got PhDs in, in the United States and Europe and so on. Those things are legal. And then there's the illegal part, which is partly uh, hacking on the internet and partly all other kinds of spying. And, you know, and the U.S. has to protect itself against the illegal part of that and probably should protect itself better even against the legal part of it in legal ways. What was bad about the DOJ China initiative under Trump, in my opinion, was its sort of uh, racial profiling of Chinese persons. Um, and But has the DOJ been able to adjust that, which is not easy because... China itself, as you know, Xi Jinping puts out that any ethnic Chinese anywhere around the world shares the Chinese blood and is, should be loyal to the nation and the party and calls upon Chinese persons, whatever their citizenship, you know, to, to contribute to the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation and so forth. So this is a, unfortunately a, a fact that, uh, that um, there are persons of Chinese ethnicity, they aren't the only ones, but they're, I'm guessing, a greater percentage of the persons who are doing espionage work for China or of Chinese ethnicity. But that, that doesn't make it okay for the DOJ to target innocent persons who happen to be Chinese. But what do you do about that? I have no information. So I don't know whether the Biden people have, I hope that they have you know, that they're doing a better job than was done under the Trump administration. The next question I picked uh, follows up on this, and it comes from a colleague, uh, Kevin Latham at SOAST. It's a rather long question. 
What do you think about the recent efforts to increase Chinese soft power internationally, ranging, ranging from the influence in overseas Chinese communities to mobilization of or through Chinese students overseas? Which of the following three positions would you agree with, if any? Number one, China is always trying hard but not really succeeding. Number two, trying harder than ever and succeeding to some, ex some degree with overseas Chinese communities and students, but not influencing foreign powers. Or number three, having greater influence with developing countries and economies, but not in Western countries. Uh -huh. Uh, I mean, do you, do, do you, or is yeah. it that the fear of Chinese soft power, something that is conjured up by hostile foreign journalists? And what does the Biden administration think about it? So what does Chinese soft power consist in? So I would say there may be uh, just off the, because this is a very stimulating question and I haven't thought about it systematically before, but let me say for now, maybe Chinese soft power consists of three themes, three main themes. One is the soft power that says the Chinese, be proud to be Chinese. The Chinese have stood up nationalism and ethnic identity. Uh, second one would be China's a benevolent power with a win-win relationship to other countries, you know, we can help you. Um, we respect you and we can help you and we're not imperialists. And the third one would be the Chinese political model, political, administrative, economic, social model is better than the bankrupt Western model. So if one thinks about these three themes and then answers Kevin's question in terms of the impact of it, I think that the, uh, that, well, as, as you know, um, China has achieved control over most Chinese language media in, in the rest of the world. Um, I participated in a project at the Hoover Institution called China's Influence and American Interests, which is available on the Hoover website for free. And it has a chapter on Chinese language media in the United States. And it points out that there's hardly any of them anymore that aren't controlled by China. So I think for the, and this is a global phenomenon. And I think also we could put in the Chinese Students and Scholars um, Association in universities and so on, that when it comes to reaching out to Chinese uh, speaking, populations around the world and saying, you know, China's really stood up in the world and is doing great. I think that's very effective. On the win-win theme, I think with where China has a lot of trade and a lot of investment and Belt and Road Initiative projects and so forth, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Argentina, whether it's in Greece, uh, that, um, or Laos or so, that in most of these countries, there are two, two sides. The side that is dealing with China, the government that's in power that signed the deal, the enterprise that is uh, you know, working with China and so forth is very convinced that, that this is a good deal. And there's always an opposition faction that says, oh, you're corrupt and you're violating the environment and things like that. So I think it's quite mixed uh, currently. <clears throat> and then in terms of the China model is a good model, this is kind of the flip side of Steve's question before. I think that uh, a lot of people now think the Chinese model is better than the American model. And this is just as China has damaged its own image through wolf warrior diplomacy. The United States is the one that's done the most to promote the Chinese model by doing such a horrible job at home. Um, democracy is looking very bad nowadays in the world, at least, uh, you know, I think American and probably UK democracy look pretty bad. Germany looks not too bad. Um, uh, and so um, I, I think a lot of serious people 
including Chinese people, including third world people, including Americans and Europeans are thinking, hey, maybe authoritarianism is not such a bad thing. They can build railways really fast. Next question comes from Sir Andrew Burns, who had extensive experience in Hong Kong. His question is that it is striking that in all your talk, you, in, in your talk, you have made no mention of Hong Kong. Does Hong Kong's future no longer matter in this context? Or is it now irrelevant to the United States? I think there's a lot of, um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit uh, I, um, biased or down in the looking at this from, I'm, I'm been pretty involved with the Hong Kong, uh, you know, diaspora movement in the United States, uh, and participated in a number of, um, you know, webinars and so forth about Hong Kong. So the, in my in my circle, there's a great deal of attention to the Hong Kong and Xinjiang issues. Now, maybe from a broader national view. The Xinjiang issue has gotten more attention than the Hong Kong issue. Um, the U.S. Congress has, I'm, I'm not quite up to date, but they've, they've adopted a, I think, passed a law for easing the uh, uh, access to uh, a green card for people who flee from Hong Kong. And there, there are a number of measures under consideration or which have been adopted in Washington to um, support people who flee from Hong Kong. So no, I if I didn't, I think I just mentioned it once in passing, It's but it, it's just because of the constraint of time that I didn't talk more uh, about it. I think it is very important in the US image of the, uh, the strategic competition and why, why um, you know, there's a lot at stake that China's the type of political system that we need to compete with and resist. But uh, as Sir Andrew would know better than I do, there is actually nothing we can do about it. Um, we have no governmental leverage. It would be it would be significant if the U.S. and global finance community were to move out of Hong Kong. From what I can see so far, they haven't made that move. They have accepted the assurance of the Hong Kong government that this has nothing to do with them. And um, and absent that type of reaction from the finance community, there's not a hell of a lot that anybody outside of China is going to be able to do to reverse the national security law and the vicious way that it's being implemented. We can't do anything for the people, the many people who've been imprisoned, the way they're being mistreated in prison, kept there without trial, without bail, isolated. Uh, um, so I, 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 it, it is important. Okay, next question I pick comes from Graham Hutchings at the Oxford uh, China Center. Your subject is changes in US policy towards China. Can you say a bit more about the potential changes in Chinese policy towards the United States mm. under Xi Jinping or perhaps um, if he is going to be around for a while, given that he's going to be around for a while, and therefore what would be the potential changes in Chinese policy towards the US? Mm -hmm. I think what you see is what you get with Xi Jinping. I don't expect a change. I think he had, I think that the, the Chinese leadership, whether it's Xi Jinping or others, um, you know, are not surprised at US hostility. I think they are realists. They felt that this uh, situation was inevitable when China became strong and tried to take its rightful place in the world. The United States as the incumbent power would resist. Um, 
that China has to keep on um, asserting its interests. And uh, um, so you're going to have the rhetoric of the win-win and you're going to have the, uh, the building up of the Chinese military. So they're very smart about investing in asymmetric military capabilities that have check, I would say, have checkmated the long, the, the inherited American military strategy around Taiwan. So we now have to adjust. Um, they're they're going to keep on, um, you know, building up their international influence. Um, but I don't expect any change. I'm not one of the ones who thinks that Xi Jinping is going to launch an attack on Taiwan in some by some deadline. Um, they, yeah, so I don't see the need for a change on their part. I think uh, they, they're, in, in response to the, um, the bad publicity that they've gotten from Wolf Warrior and from certain BRI projects and so forth, China may, may, may adjust in a way that we like actually and become, you know, try to soften their image because they, they are capable of adaptation when they get a bad result. The well, next question I picked comes from a uh, PhD student at SOAS, uh, Malika Robinson. Mm -hmm. To what extent does the national identity dynamic within China and the United States contribute to the US-China tension, particularly over the trade war? The issues uh, Malika has in mind include telling China's story well and also foreign policy for the middle class, obviously one for China, the other for the US. Yeah. Um, hi, Malika. <laughs> nice to hear from you. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that, that the United States policymakers don't understand is the so the United States policymakers tend to view the Chinese middle class as natural allies of the United States. And that includes the students and the intellectuals and the entrepreneurs and the people who come here as tourists and the people who come here as students and so on. They think, we, we, we tend to think they should be friendly to us what I think we don't understand is the pride of Chinese people in their Chinese identity. And that when the United States positions itself as sort of saying that China's a barbarian, you know, atheist civilization that's out to ruin the world and burning too much coal and shameful and, you know, and all the things that are said about China, in the United States that many Chinese people uh, feel that their identity as Chinese persons is, is being offended by that. You know, they may be critical of some of the things of their own regime, but they still want to be respected as a great country and a great civilization and so on. I think there is that. And then I think in the United States that, uh, there are some, you know, the United States is a country with very deep racial stereo, you know, I want to say racism is such a vague term, but, you know, sort of gut belief in race differences and race hierarchy and so forth is very deeply built in. Not that we're the only country like that into our political culture. And I think there's a, um, well, there's a very explicit white supremacy movement, but I think even broader than that is this assumption of Western advanced, progressive, advanced country, most civilized country, city on a hill, and so forth kind of a thing that, that makes a lot of Americans kind of inherently uh, antagonistic to an upstart country of another race, as it were. So I think I, I agree with Malaika that, you know, that these um, 
identity attitudes, as she calls it, which is probably a polite term for it, kind of racialized identity attitudes, are very, very important in the, in the dynamic at the public opinion level. But what I hope for is that at the leadership level, and I think that's true in both the Xi and Biden administrations that you're talking about, sophisticated realist politicians and international realist geopolitical realism is a pretty pitiless uh, you know, discipline, but at least it's got strong elements of of instrumental rationality, so that's where, where I, you know, I, I hope that 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 these these prejudices won't carry us away into a unnecessary degree of conflict. Okay, we still got quite a few questions. Um, I'd like to pick the next one from Grace Gouj, which is a bit of a critical question. Mm -hmm. You said China doesn't intend to upset the liberal world order. She said it is not so. China has every intention to be master of the world. To be master of the world as they say in the international. And this is evidenced by Xi Jinping's rhetoric and public sentiment in China. She would like to know what is the basis of your conclusion that China is not trying to replace the United States as the world leader. Right, okay, so I think I would like to divide that question into two parts, one about the liberal international order and the other one about replacing the United States as the world leader. So, so what is the liberal international order? Um, it is, for example, the United Nations Security Council that is supposed to, you know, that armed interventions in the internal affairs of countries are only legal if the Security Council authorizes them. Um, you know, a, a world trading order with the maximum amount of freedom of trade. Um, uh, um, you know, international airlines, international shipping, insurance, banking, international, you know, and all this stuff is the liberal international order that I have in mind. And I think that China basically likes that order, but they were not satisfied with their, and, and so they've put their people into leading positions in the World Bank, into the IMF, into the, into Interpol, into the World Health Organization, you know. So in other words, that, that existing set of institutions, many of the UN institutions and the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, China has no fundamental alternative to those things, except that it has set up a number of its own institutions that do kind of the same thing, like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, that, they, they participate actively in the UN human rights institutions and they try to weaken, as I said, the impact of those institutions on China itself, but they like to use them to criticize uh, countries that they wanna criticize. So that, that's what I meant by not wanting to overthrow. So they don't wanna dissolve the UN or to return to autarky or protectionism. I mean, in a certain sense, the US under Trump was more antagonistic to the liberal international order than China has been in the post Mao period. Um, and of course the Soviet Union had its kind of own international order and didn't participate much in the Western one. China wants to participate in the one global one. Now, in terms of replacing the United States as the dominant power, my understanding is that China knows that there is not gonna be, that the, this, the, when the US was the so-called sole superpower in the world after the collapse of the Soviet Union for 20 years maybe, um, from 1991 to like 2001, that, that's not gonna happen again. There's not gonna be any sole superpower. 
um, the United States may be messed up, you know, as it appears to be, but it's not going to disappear. It may become the number two economy if China becomes number one, but the United States will still be a big economy with a big military and a lot of allies. The EU is not going to disappear. Russia is not going to, Japan's not going to disappear. India is not going to disappear. So there's really not going to be another sole superpower. It's not going to be the US and it's not going to be China. I think that is the Chinese assessment about the future shape of world power. Okay, <clears throat> we got actually about um, six or so really good questions, but I'll pick one on the tech side, which comes from Duncan Hewitt, a research associate sourced. Given what you said about the tech, how far do you think the US should restrict market access to Chinese tech firms like Huawei, China Telecom, or even TikTok? Mm -hmm. um, so market, so what I, my understanding of this is, you know, is a, a very amateur, but I think the number one issue is not about market access, but it's about uh, uh, commanding proprietary technology that's going to become the global standard going forward in any of these areas. And, and But with respect specifically to market access for Huawei, I think it's, it's number one, it is about espionage. I think that, that you know, again, I'm, I lack the technical expertise, but I find it entirely credible that if you build a Huawei infrastructure, you're giving them, giving the Chinese security agencies a, a key to all of your information. Um, and it's also, of course, about um, we, we are behind in, in developing the 5G or the 6G technology. But in the meantime, we don't want Huawei to sort of lock it all down. So that would be the reason for denying market access to Huawei. China Telecom, I don't know exactly what technology they, they sell. So I'm not, I can't comment on their market access and TikTok is a whole nother issue, I think. It's not, as far as I understand it, it's not about high tech. It is about collecting um, information about our citizens and feeding it into their artificial intelligence databases and things of that kind. And I don't think that TikTok collects any, any information that actually has intelligence use in terms of, you know, politics and technology and military and stuff like that. But I don't even use Facebook. I'm the last human being in the world who doesn't use it. So much less, and I certainly don't use TikTok because that's, as I understand it, is for teenagers. That's what I heard. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, probably the last question, and it comes from uh, Lithuania, from uh, Konstantinos Andriakos. Right. Um, is there any willingness by the current administration to tackle China's real or alleged malign influence in those domains that form an important part of American soft power globally? Mm -hmm. For example, Hollywood or NBA. If yes, then how could it be done in practice considering that these are businesses? Exactly. Yes, Constantinus, thank you for that question. I don't, this, the way the American system works, as you said, you know, these are private enterprises, Hollywood and the NBA and academia and publishing and so on. And journalism are private uh, enterprises or operations. And it's hard for the government to intervene and I'm not aware of any effort to do so. Sometimes these, um, um, I'm not saying these specific ones, but sometimes groups that are subjected to Chinese pressure, business, especially businesses, 
that are subjected to Chinese pressure will go crying to the administration and say, do something to protect us, in the, but don't, don't use my name, you know? And then the government officials will tell them, what, what can we do? What do you expect us to do to protect you? You have to stand up and protect yourself and refuse to bow to Chinese pressure. There's been a lot of discussion of this in the China policy community about what can we do? And what has often been proposed, say, is that, um, say, think tanks get together and have a code of conduct, or universities get together and have a code of conduct so that we present a common front to the Chinese, because the Chinese like to um, you know, isolate a particular target, a particular basketball team, a particular sports league, a particular hotel or airline company, isolate them. And if there was a, a, a code of conduct that where the whole community of that type of organization stood behind some principles that would help. But those codes of conduct have not yet come into existence um, as far as I know. So this is a real tough policy problem to which no solution has yet been found. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, Professor Nathan for sharing your very insightful thoughts with us. I'm afraid that we still have quite a number of very, very good questions that I have not been able to put to you. Um, they will be shared with you after the event, but I'm afraid that we have reached the limits of our time. So let me just thank all of you who have taken part, asked questions and also listened to Professor Nathan's talk and above all to P Professor Nathan for his uh, fantastic uh, webinar. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.